Hello, my name is Curtis Eckerman, and in this video I'm going to cover how to use the basic functions of GenBank. GenBank is a genetic repository of information. Whenever scientists publish information about um, genetics, and it doesn't always have to even be published, they will submit their data here in the form of DNA sequences, protein sequences, and or protein structures. There's a few other things that can go into that, but that's the uh, the basic idea. There are several banks of genetic information. GenBank is one of those. is probably the oldest and uh, um, probably the most extensive of those types of banks for uh, that serves as a repository for genetic information. Now it's run by the National Center for Biotechnology Information, or NCBI, and that's why you see the uh, logo up here on the left. Um, and the link that I've given you in the lab uh, will take you here to this particular page. And there's a lot going on in GenBank. GenBank, uh, there's a lot of research associated with GenBank and other things. We're going to use it for a specific type of information. We're going to be looking for a, uh, a sequence of protein that we can compare between different organisms for a phylogenetic analysis. And there's, before you get started, you have to know two things. You need to know what marker you're going to be looking for, what genetic marker are you going to be looking for, and what organisms are you going to be looking for uh, for that purpose. Now in the case of the lab, we're going to be using a gene that's commonly used in what's called DNA barcoding for animals. We're going to be using cytochrome C oxidase subunit 1. And um, the reasons for these choices are vary, vary a little bit, but the uh, main gist of why cytochrome C oxidase subunit 1 has been chosen for animals for the kind of uh, 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 default marker for organisms is that when you're looking at species and you want to differentiate between, say, species 1 and species 2 of two different mammals, you want to find a marker that is appropriate for that level of differentiation. That is to say, in the, gene, in the genome, some genes change very quickly and some do not. And certainly non-coding uh, areas of the DNA can change very rapidly. And you need to find the appropriate markers that are changing at the appropriate rates to give you information about um, relationships. So cytochrome C, ox uh, cytochrome C uh, oxidase subunit 1 is a mitochondrial gene. It's important because it's part, it's the main subunit of a cytochrome um, oxidase uh, complex that is used in the electron transport chain in the mitochondria. The, the choice of this gene is important in, for two reasons. One of those is that it is a, an important gene and therefore it is conserved, meaning it doesn't have that much variation. It has some, otherwise we wouldn't be able to tell differences between species but it's not so variable that we lose information. The other important thing about this gene is that it's from the mitochondria. Mitochondrial DNA does not suffer some of the same problems that nuclear DNA does, and especially the fact that it doesn't duplicate or form copies of itself uh, sim uh, like nuclear DNA does. What happens in nuclear DNA is that occasionally the DNA um, duplicates or even tripli uh, uh, forms triplicate, triplicate copies, in some cases many more, especially some plants. And so you have multiple copies of a gene floating around in the genome of nuclear DNA. This is a problem for analysis because um, each of those genes can change independently and making sure that you're comparing one gene that is the same as another gene in the second species can be difficult with nuclear DNA. You end up with what are called paralogous comparisons, basically genes that may look a lot alike but don't say, share the same origin. That's not quite the problem with mitochondrial DNA. We don't have that problem of duplication, and we can be sure that we are making orthologous comparisons, that is, comparisons of DNA that have a similar um, history. So with that being said, we're going to now search for cytochrome C oxidase subunit 1. And so up here in the search bar, I'm just going to type that. But I also told you that you need to know the organisms that you are looking for. So in this case, we're going to start with Canis latrans. Extra credit if you remember what this is. This is the coyote. And we're just going to look for this. Now, I also need to change one other thing. Right now, I have it set to nucleotide information. It's going to find 
the DNA sequence. But remember, for our exercise, we're going to use protein sequences. So we're going to go down here and we're going to look for protein. And there we go, protein. And now we can do a search. So this is going to search for Canis latrans, the coyote, cytochrome C oxidase subunit 1 protein sequence. Now, as I scroll down, I have to be careful uh, for a few different things. I have to look for a few different things. Remember that um, this data is coming from many different researchers who are doing research on different things. They're not always uh, doing phylogenetic analysis. They may be looking at evolutionary rates of change, things like that. There's all sorts of different uh, places that this data could come from. And so in some cases, they're not looking at the entire length of the protein. So I know that this subunit is about 530 to 550 pro, uh, uh, amino acids long. So this is probably the complete subunit one, but you can look down here and see that it's looking at 137 amino acids instead. So it's only looking at a, um, a partial or a fragment of um, that particular uh, a subunit. I also notice that this does not say Canis latrans, but if you were to look into it more deeply, you can click on this link and see where it came from. So for instance, I'm going to click here and it's going to tell you a lot of things. It'll tell you the source of where this came from. Well, if you do a little digging and you look at this uh, carefully, you realize that this is a paper on um, the parasites that are found in the coyote, and that's this, this uh, Echinococcus is one of the uh, uh, parasites that you can find inside of it. So we have to scroll down, and we may have to look for a little bit. There we go. Now we can see Canis latrans, 514 amino acid protein. So this is probably the, uh, the majority of the subunit, so that would be one that I'd be interested in. And I can see one that's uh, 261, so this is certainly a partial. I also notice that this is subunit 3, so basic, basically I want to avoid this one. So I want to make sure that my search uh, matches. So this is indeed subunit 1. This is Canis latrans. It's the whole protein, and so I'm, I'm ready to access this information. Now, there's some shortcuts. We're going to get to that. Let's go ahead and click on this link. Let's say I want this, um, um, these amino acids. Well, I can do a number of things. First of all, I can again see where this came from. I can see the source of this particular information. If I scroll to the bottom, I see the sequence. Okay, I could copy it from here, but there's an easier way to do this. I'm going to scroll back to the top. There's FASTA. Now, um, this is something that I've discussed in um, the lab materials. Because many different programs utilize this information for different kinds of analysis, um, there was a convention at the early on to f uh, have a uh, format such that multiple programs could read it without having to reformat it for each individual program. So they agreed upon uh, several formats, and one of the most widely used is something called the FASTA format. And so if I click on this, it'll come to the FASTA format here although this is, this is not quite completely in FASTA format. But um, the idea is that you uh, have your sequence. There's, there's 20 different letters used for the amino acids. And this is my sequence here. And you start it by labeling your sequence with this greater than symbol and then having your name. Now this information you're going to have to, if when you copy it over, you're going to have to delete or you're going to have to reformat because otherwise it'll try to analyze that. But this is the FASTA uh, uh, setup. What I would do for my analysis is I would then copy this and then I would paste it into um, my uh, a Word program or whatever program that I'm going to use. So I'm gonna just going to type in note here, notepad. I'm going to open up notepad. I'm going to paste it here. And knowing that I need to, uh, I'm going to get rid of this material. In fact, I can rename this if I wanted to. I could just name Canis. Now, I can't have spaces in the initial um, a labeling, so I'm going to use an underscore latrans. Okay, then I'm going to uh, go back and I, let's find a second sequence. So I'll go back to this. I'm going to go all the way to the top. This is my original search. And I'm going to add um, to this, I'm going to add Canis domesticus, the, the dog, the common dog. And it should come up with, oh, I forgot that the taxonomic change, there's been a taxonomic change to this as Canis lupus familiaris. But again, as I'm looking, I can see subunit one, but this is only 225 proteins. So part of it will line up with what I have so far, 
but I'm going to continue to scroll down to see if I can't find one that has more amino acids. And so far, nothing. But I can see I have I have 75 pages of these, and so I'm going to continue. I'm just going to do a quick scroll through. And it looks like these are probably all part of a particular type of of analysis. I'm going to just pick a random page here. So 22. What the heck? Ah, here we go. There's one. I've got one here. 514 amino acid proteins. It's subunit one. It's from the dog. I'll click on it. And without even going to the bottom, I'm going to just click on FASTA. And there's my sequence. I'm going to copy it. And then I'm going to go to my notepad here. And I'm going to paste it. I'm going to... Uh, edit the name of this, so Canis Lupus Familiaris. Okay, so I would keep doing this for all of the organism that I'm interested in doing um, an analysis of, and uh, so I might have just a few dozen, I might have hundreds, of, so it depends upon what I'm going to analyze. Uh, next, what we're going to do after this is we're going to take this notepad sequence and we're going to put it into Clustal W. Or there's a, again a number of programs, but for our purposes, we're going to use Clustal W online. It allows us to do this all online without having to download a separate program. And I will show you how to do that um, with these sequences. I'm going to add a few to this um, so that we can uh, uh, see how it all works when we do the analysis. So that is GenBank. That's how you would go in and find information. You have to know some information going into it. But uh, in the end, this is how you would extract that information, download it, and then get it ready for analysis. And in this case, we're going to be simply looking at some of the analysis of different dog species or the canids. That is, the we're gonna, I'm going to add a wolf here and probably a few other things uh, to our analysis. Okay, in the uh, next few videos that you'll see for the lab, if you're following along in the lab, will be how to use Clustal W.